Done. Perfect. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Andrew Klonicki, and he is going to be making what I consider to be the world's best zucchini muffins with zucchini from his own garden. But before he does that, we're going to hear a little bit about the wonderful work he did while he was a physician at Kaiser Permanente up near where I live near Sacramento. Please welcome Dr. Klonicki to the show. How are you doing? Pretty good. I guess that's for me because the other people can't talk back to you yet, right? <laughs> well, they can talk, they can type. I can't see them. You and I are the only yeah, ones on Zoom. They can chat. So I've had your muffins and they're phenomenal and you can talk about how the recipe was developed. But first, let's talk about you. You actually had to go under the knife before you learned what you know now. That's true. Uh, about 12 years ago, I had a six vessel coronary artery bypass graft surgery. And it wasn't until the recovery uh, that I learned about how actually I could have prevented my heart disease with a diet. Uh, and I have two people to thank for that. Uh, the first was a nurse at Kaiser. I took the cardiac rehab course. And uh, even though my cardiologist said, oh, you don't need to do that. But I really felt like I wanted to be one of the patients. And so I took the course. And this nurse was very interesting because she talked about the American Heart Association uh, cardiac diet, which is actually not very cardiac because it's about 30% fat. And then at the end, she said, but if it was me, I would go on a whole foods plant-based diet. And that was really the first thing that any of us had heard about that. Uh, and then maybe a week or two later, uh, uh, from my friend Milt Fredenberg, whom you've met, um, I got three books in the mail, which was very interesting to me because I didn't, I didn't know he had an interest in the subject. Uh, but two of the books I picked up and read fairly immediately, and that was the China study by T. Colin Campbell and Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Caldwell Esselstyn. And I remember the very first graphic that I saw in uh, Campbell's book was on the incidence of uh, deaths from heart attacks in males aged 55 to 59 in countries across the world and in relationship to the amount of animal protein ingested. And it was pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship. And the demographic of males 55 to 59 kind of fit for me. And so that, that really struck me. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I talked with, with Kathy, my wife, and you know, we took the information seriously and started ordering some other books. And uh, I remember the first book I bought was uh, Dean Arnish's, one of Dean Arnish's books. I got it for 75 cents. And the very first recipe I made was a black bean chili. And we started to attend um, anything that had to do with plant-based eating. And of course, that's where we met you uh, in North Sacramento. And I think the second book we bought was actually unprocessed uh, book that you wrote probably, what, 15 years ago? Yeah. Uh, wow. And, you know, we, yeah, we, we, you know, the book is still on the shelf and we still use it, you know, our, our two favorite recipes are, you know, Kathy's modification of your lentil loaf, in which we have at least monthly, and then my favorite black bean cupcakes, which are black bean mountain brownies. So, um, and I, I, I think as I found out this information, it was it. I, I became somewhat angry, uh, first of all, at myself because. I didn't know this, uh, and secondarily, you know, at all the all the and these were good physicians that treated me. All the good physicians that treated me, that not a single one of them said anything about changing my lifestyle and potentially reversing my disease. And so, for me, that set me about trying to pass on that information to the doctors at my medical center. And so I gave as many talks as I possibly could, including the whole staff and individual departments like cardiology, radiology, oncology. And also, you know, both Kathy and I got immersed in the local vegan society and 
I gave talks there, um, went to Woodland when they were having a health fair, even went to Scottsdale, Arizona and talked at St. Jude Medical, <laughs> the pacemaker people. And they, they actually started a, a small plant-based group there uh, with some phenomenal results. Um, I worked through our physician health and wellness committee um, and uh, we, we began a yearly vegan fest where uh, other physicians who are plant-based would cook and we would invite a hundred physicians and their spouses to the local Seventh-day Adventist uh, church uh, and um, have a talk and also share food. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we also did that at the Carmichael Seventh-day Adventist church with you. Uh, and we actually, I think, cooked some of the stuff in our kitchen at, at home. You know, so I was just trying to spread the news to people. Uh, but the thing that I really wanted to do more than anything is I wanted to have an intensive plant-based program for patients with chronic disease. And, and it took me about five years to get administration to finally let me have a pilot uh, for 15 patients. And these, so, so by definition, they had to have either three chronic diseases or be on five chronic disease medications. And, you know, so this was the last year that I was actively working. And I, I was very impressed by the fact that everybody got better. Everybody, you know, there was weight loss, there was reduction in cholesterol, there was reduction in diabetes medication. And these were patients that had been on the best uh, programs that Kaiser had to offer, you know, so no one expected them to get any better and, and yet they did. So, um, you know, if, if I'd been a little bit younger, I guess, uh, <laughs> I might as, you know, potentially this could have been an, an ongoing program for myself and whether it still exists or not, I do not know, but it was certainly uh, proof positive that uh, you could affect your health very, very significantly by your lifestyle, particularly on nutrition. How easy or how hard was it to get Kaiser to, to do these programs? Uh, it, was, it was fairly difficult. I think that the, the, there is a reluctance, and for a couple of reasons, first of all, um, you know, they had programs, you know, they had, they had a, they had a program called phase prevent heart attacks and strokes every day it, it what phase stands for. And in fact, uh, when I first found out that my cholesterol was elevated, I chose one of the phase physicians as my own personal physician. Um, and, but unfortunately the emphasis and focus was really on taking statins and exercising and, calorie restriction for weight loss. And so they kind of missed the point there. But at any rate, what I was trying to say is that, you know, they felt that they already had a, a program that was sufficient for what they wanted to accomplish. And I think the other thing is, is that it's difficult for, um, it's difficult for organizations to spend money up front for savings on the backside. But you know, for Kaiser Permanente, this should be a no-brainer because, uh, if, you know, anytime we have to do a big procedure, you know, my bypass cost them somewhere between a quarter to half a million dollars. And how much would it have cost them to, you know, teach me about plant-based eating in the beginning? The, the return on investment would be absolutely huge. Uh, no more, no more bl blindness from diabetes, no more renal failure from diabetes, no more amputations from diabetes. I mean, it's just astronomical, the savings that could occur, but yet organizations seem to be loath to, uh, you know, expend the money in, in advance. And I think those were the two major factors. Wow. How easy or how hard was it for you to change your diet? It's funny because uh, it was easy for a, a couple of reasons. Number one, Kathy's already a great cook anyhow. So she understands spices and herbs and uh, flavor. Uh, so that was one reason, you know, I mean, I started cooking a few things and I don't know if she felt sorry for me or she didn't like my cooking, but <laughs> she took, took over fairly soon. But I think the other thing is, is that I had a, a I had a real, 
um, light bulb moment, understanding that, you know, food, food is binary. Food is binary. Food can either nourish you or it can hurt you. And so I didn't have a problem with any meals that we cook, even if they weren't quite right yet. They all are now, but at the beginning, I knew that even if I didn't like the meal, it wasn't hurting me. Because I think one of the things that people fail to understand is that you go, okay, so you had a bi so you had a heart bypass, so you're okay now. No, I have vascular disease and I have arteries that go to my brain and my kidneys and my intestines and my legs. And these are affected as well. So I have a lot of I have a lot of arteries that I have to take care of that I haven't been taking care of. And so yeah, maybe maybe. Maybe I did need the bypass. Maybe it prevented me from having a, a more severe event, but I had a lot of other arteries that needed protection. So um, I was very motivated not to eat foods that would harm these other arteries. You know, if I, if I, you know, I did have diabetes, you know, before I became plant-based. And if I went blind as a nuclear medicine physician, I'm out of a job. <laughs> you know, if I can't see a scan to interpret it, I'm in deep trouble, not to mention the poor patient that's relying on me saying something intelligent about about the scan. So I think from the point of view that I was doing something very positive for myself, um, it was easy in that regard. Um, the difficult part is that too many people don't understand what it is to be plant-based. You know, they go, oh, you're vegan. So you eat carrot sticks and celery sticks. No, not exactly. You know, I mean, it, it's it's so amazing how often if we do go someplace, you know, somebody goes, okay, so here's your cut up veggies. You know, I mean, that's what they, they really don't understand what a whole foods plant-based diet is. So that's the only difficult thing. But, you know, as my wife says, it's America. If we can't eat tonight, we can always eat tomorrow. You know, so we, uh, we, we, we get we get over that quickly. Dr. Klonicki, just in case somebody is watching and they haven't heard of nuclear medicine as a specialty, can you talk a little bit about what that is? And the reason I'm asking, because is that a specialty where you were able to actually talk to patients about plant-based diets? Yes. Um, the, the nuclear medicine deals with um, probably 65% diagnosis. So in, in, in 35%, um, therapy. And so in a given week, um, I wouldn't see as many patients as say an internist, but, you know, we'd probably see 10, 12 patients. And, you know, some of the patients were um, uh, Graves disease patients or autoimmune thyroid disease patients. And, you know, I would speak to them about it all the time, knowing that plant-based eaters have uh, 50 percent less autoimmune disease than those who eat the standard American diet. Uh, and so and also if I saw patients say for thyroid cancer or thyroid nodules, if they had diseases, you know if they had chronic diseases that would avail themselves of, of a lifestyle change, I would always bring it up to them. And um, it was interesting that there was, there was a certain amount of pushback from some of the patients, but every now and then I would hear from one of the um, primary care physicians. They'd say, oh, Mrs. So-and-so wanted to let you know that she went plant-based and she feels like you saved her life. So yes, I would talk to all of, you know, any of the patients that I saw, I would talk to them about that. Nice. I, I wish I'd been more successful, but you know, <laughs> that's up to the patient. At least they know you know, which is more than I can say about myself. I remember, I, had the bypass. I remember when I was really young, I, I, I had to eat an egg salad sandwich. This was thank goodness before I was vegan as part of a nuclear medicine test. So as today as a vegan, would they have a different option for me? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I think what you probably had is you probably had a gastric emptying study and that's, that's when we feed you the egg. <laughs> but they do have, but, so they, yes, they have no, vegan, vegan options now. Absolutely. It might be a tofu scramble, for instance, instead of the egg. 
That's great. Cause I didn't really, until I saw a nuclear medicine doctor, I had no idea what it even was. Yeah. You know, the other thing is when you're asked about talking with patients is that you know, one of our, one of our most common uh, studies is a heart scan. And so whenever I got the, you know, whenever I presented results to patients about the heart scan, I would always bring it up as well. Um, because I thought that that would be, uh, the most appropriate for them in terms of their, their future well-being. What was the, what was the, how many bypasses graphs did you have? Six. I'm sorry, I lost sound. Too many. Six. Six. Oh, six. 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 Is, is six the maximum? I've heard of seven, but six is a bunch, you know? And, you know, and the other thing that's really interesting is, is that, um, um, and you may have seen that in one of the medium posts I sent you, that the day before surgery, the surgeon came by and, and they give you informed consent. And, you know, he said, well, you could die from the anesthesia. You know, you could, you could have a stroke and then die, or you could get infected and then die. And it, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't think that patients realize that what we do is not always non-harmful. And if you think about changing your diet versus, you know, having bypass and, and risking your life on the, on, on the surgery table, you know, too many people think, say, oh, I just, I don't think I could do that. But if they thought about the alternatives, maybe they could, you know, I sure would have liked to. But tell wasn't it a, a pretty rough operation? Both my father and grandfather had it, and boy, they did not bounce back quickly from it. I was lucky in that regard. Um, you know, it's kind of weird. Uh, the, <laughs> the thing I was most concerned about uh, was getting an infection in bone in the middle of your chest. This is where they saw through you. And uh, I felt I thought if I got an infection there, then every breath I would take or any movement would be painful. And one of my Air Force buddies, uh, the first day after surgery, came by to visit and he brought me a squash from the farmer's market. So I'm in intense cardiac intensive care and he's bringing me this squash and I'm thinking, did you wash that? That's been out in the field. So I said, well, put it in the sink. And as soon as he left, I had the nurse throw it away, you know, cause I was too worried about that. That's but uh, and, but, you know, I was surprised at the recovery, you know, by, you know, we had been walking 40 minutes a day prior to surgery. And the second day I was home, which was five days after bypass, I went out and walked 40 minutes. My neighbor kind of set me up for uh, uh, having a really tough time because he was, two things. One, he was talking about having bad pain for a month after surgery. And he had had bypass. And then also I had visited him in the hospital and his post-operative period. And, and he had mental issues. He didn't even remember me visiting him. And so I was thinking, well, this could be bad, but I actually didn't take a single pain pill uh, when I came home and got back to activity pretty quickly. So it wasn't bad, but it can be. I know that it can be. That's great. That's fantastic. But if you had known there was an option, do you think you might've taken it like before having surgery? If you knew that you could have just changed your diet to either prevent or reverse your heart disease, do you think you might've done it? That's the $64,000 question. Um, and, and I, I, you're not the first to ask me that. Um, and I, I, I don't honestly know, um, because now I've seen the benefits. I mean, I've, I've, I've always struggled with my weight. I now weigh what I weighed in high school as a senior. Um, maintaining a steady weight has, been, has never been easier. Um, I've not had any cardiac symptoms. My diabetes is gone. My high cholesterol is gone. Um, I don't, if, if someone could have told me all that, I don't know, you know, it's, it, it's difficult to say. I, 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 would like to, I would like to tell you that, oh, absolutely, I would choose, you know, 
the, the easier road uh, and not risk um, the surgery. But I can't tell you for sure what I would have done, but I would have liked to have had the chance, you know? And I think that that's the problem with, with our system, meaning the medical system today is that uh, patients aren't given the choice. And in fact, if you think about it, that's actually malpractice because when you are telling someone about a procedure that you're recommending, you're actually supposed to give them all the options. They're supposed to, they're supposed to know all the side effects and they're supposed to know, are there other options? And no one gave me those other options. So technically I don't think that's right, but you know, you have to kind of blame medical education a little bit because, you know, I certainly didn't get any nutrition. And the only thing they told us was about vitamins and they gave us a free book on vitamins from Upjohn, one of the pharmaceutical companies. So one of the things that I, I was gonna say, one of the things that I do like doing now is that I have been, um, every year I do give a, a, a short series of lectures at the private medical school in town, California, North State University. So at least, at least I know that the medical students there, they're getting at least two hours, <laughs> which is not a lot. Um, although it's interesting, so I give them my personal information and some of them will email me and ask me questions. So that's, that's kind of rewarding, you know, so hopefully at least a few physicians are, are, are going to, uh, be able to tell people about lifestyle alternatives. I'll tell you an interesting story. One of the professors at, uh, one of the staff at CNSU was one of our psychiatrists at Kaiser Permanente. And for some reason or other, he had a, a coronary uh, CT angiogram. And he had a very, very high coronary calcium score, which, correlates with significant coronary artery disease. And he had, he had heard my lectures um, that I'd given to the medical students. So he became plant-based. And um, he actually, he and his wife went shopping with Kathy and I, you know, in terms of, you know, what kind of foods to buy and what to avoid. And um, he also wanted to see one of, you know, we do have at least one cardiologist who's versed in plant-based nutrition. And um, he, he, so I suggested he see this cardiologist. But when he got there, she was not available. And he saw a new resident from UCLA, a newly trained cardiologist, five months out of residency at UCLA. And he asked this new cardiologist from UCLA, <laughs> about what he thought about plant-based eating. And he said, gosh, I don't know anything about that. And I think that's just, that's just very damning of our system that, you know, a cardiologist comes out of freshly out of training this day and age and knows nothing about plant-based eating and coronary disease. And that just kind of tells you what, what the state of the union is. And it's not, it's not, it's not good, you know, if that's going to be the case. Do you find that a little bit aggravating? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and 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 I and I don't know where. I don't know where the change has to happen, you know, so that all because you know it's kind of weird that we have a specialty called lifestyle medicine, because really lifestyle medicine should be part of every type of practice, you know, because because we know that lifestyle impacts your heart, it impacts your endocrine system, it impacts your mental uh, health. Um, and so, uh, you know, for men, it has to do with, you know, eating the wrong kinds of foods, it's going to increase your risk for prostate cancer. For women, it's going to increase breast cancer. You know, lifestyle medicine should be embedded within every specialty. It shouldn't really be its own specialty. And so how that's gonna, you know, I, I don't know if the, if the government has to be involved with that, but you know, I, I, I don't know that they're gonna do anything about that because they're already the ones that are subsidizing bad foods through what they subsidize in the farm bill. So I don't have 
I don't have a lot of hope there. I, I think it's going to have to be individuals, um, Rajiv, Columbus Batiste, you know, people shouting about it and trying to tell other people uh, about what needs to be done. Yeah. While you were still working at Kaiser, were you able to influence any of your colleagues to change their diet? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, um, maybe Ernie Bodai a little bit, although he was starting to go down that path to begin with. Um, I think, you know, I had... The, the departments that I have the most interaction with were cardiology and oncology. And I do know that some of the physicians in both were um, true believers in plant-based eating uh, relative to good health, whether they changed because of, because, whether they're already there or, or because of, I don't know, you know, so, so I don't know, you know. Uh, we have a question from a live viewer named Mona. Do you see a younger group, even in medical school, moving into plant-based teaching? That's a, that's a good question. I, I think what I see is there's more interest in uh, nutrition. Um, and, and, and I don't get a lot of questions from the medical students, but the few questions that I've got demonstrates that there's a there, there's the cognizance of lifestyle being involved with, with, with health. Uh, negatively, if it's the wrong lifestyle, positively, if it's the right lifestyle. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's a groundswell, but just the fact that there are some that are interested, I, I think that's, that's good. And I know that uh, when I was still uh, working at Kaiser Roseville, that there were a um, there was a small group of of uh, internal medicine docs that were trying to push for a you know kind of lifestyle medicine medicine clinic, but I don't think that that ever occurred. But at least it was uh, heartening to know that there were people who thought about that. Thank you. Uh, there's a question: Do you still have to get regular angiograms, and has your heart function improved measurably? The short answer is no, um, and it's kind of interesting. I, in, in the 12 years since bypass, I've had one treadmill study, which was probably at about five years after. And actually, um, I, I had to request it, <laughs> you know, and, but I didn't really request it. I just, well, I mean, didn't we do something? Um, but here, here's the problem, you know, my neighbor that I alluded to earlier who has, uh, who had a bypass and had the more difficult recovery, he does a treadmill every year. But the difference between him and I is that he, he has, he sees a fee-for-service cardiologist and the fee-for-service cardiologist is only going to do, make money if he does stuff. And so our, our system of reimbursement is actually, um, it's counter- intuitive to managing lifestyle because, you know, say if, if, if you rely on repeat business and you make everybody healthy and there is no repeat business, you're, you're financially at a disadvantage. Um, and so for at, at Kaiser Permanente, they don't need repeat business. They just need to do the right thing. And so when I talked with my cardiologist, she said, Hey, you're, you're not having any symptoms and everything looks fine. Why do you want any more studies? You know, if you have, if you have problems, if you, if you're starting to get weakness or shortness of breath or chest pain or, you know, rapid heartbeats or anything, sure, we'll do something, but you know, you are doing fine. And all my, I mean, the incredible thing is, is that, um, I mean, my cholesterol is well below 150. My LDL is below 80. Uh, my sugar is normal. All my labs are all, you know, my uh, inflammatory markers are, are normal. My liver function is fine. I mean, everything looks fine. So there's really no reason to do anything on me. 
you know, if I started getting short of breath walking around the block or having a chest discomfort, then yeah, then I would have something done. But I don't, I don't want to do an angiogram just to see how everything looks because there are potential problems. You know, there are side effects doing an angiogram. You know, you can have a blood clot to your leg and lose a leg. You can have a blood clot to your lung and, or to your brain and have a stroke. You can get an artery can be punctured. <laughs> then you need emergency surgery again. So um, I think too often we don't think about, you know, the downsides of all these procedures. Yeah. Do you have to take any medication? Uh, I, I do for a long-standing high blood pressure. Uh, I take one, one medication. I was able to stop diabetes and the diabetes pills and the statins. So uh, that's been my only annoyance uh, is that I couldn't get rid of that one either. But I, I suspect that that's part of the vascular disease, you know, and so I may have a lot of hypertension originates from the kidney. And so, you know, if I've got some, you know, I've thought about this, I, if I have some kidney artery uh, narrowing, then, um, you know, or, or sclerosis in the aorta, these things would produce high blood pressure as well. So I think it's just part of the whole vascular disease process. Yeah. So start so, early so you don't have to take anything. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So tell us about these magical muffins you make. I've had them. They're amazing. You should sell them. Yes. Yes. In my spare time. Um, well, um, where do you want to start? You want to see some of the recipe being done or do you want to see the end product or oh but if you want you can um, right now if you if you if there's a way to like maybe lower the camera or lift up what you're doing we'd love to see how you make them and also the okay. finished product but you can also talk about how they came to be sure. well uh, you know they they kind of came to be you know just as part of the plant our our plant-based movement and we like the garden so we always have to try and figure out what to do you know, each zucchini bush produces phenomenal numbers of zucchini. So we're always on the lookout for recipes and wondering, you know, what uh, what can we do with all these zucchinis growing in the garden? So, so I think Kathy started fiddling with it, and she was doing carrots and apples, and I don't think she was doing zucchinis. Then we ended up substituting the zucchinis, but. At any rate, it's it's a nice recipe because it, it has zucchini, oatmeal, dates, pecans, um, unsweetened applesauce, and that's pretty much it. Um, so, and they're they're very easy to make. I, I I I have my favorite little mini food processor here because the way it starts out, you need to kind of take your oatmeal and. Uh, uh, grind it, you know, process it down into kind of a coarse flour. And so in my, I guess you can see that kind of. So I've done that already with two cups of oats and added two tablespoons of flax, uh, half a tablespoon of baking powder and a teaspoon of baking soda, some spices, I like cinnamon, a little allspice and a very generous grating of nutmeg. We love nutmeg. And so I'll just kind of mix that up a little bit, just kind of get them all together there. And, you know, once you've done that, I, I've, I've pre-graded pre a medium zucchini. I think you can see that there. When you do the zucchini, do you ever squeeze out the extra moisture with a paper towel when you're cooking with zucchini for baking? Oh, no, I do not because the zucchini is providing the moisture for the muffins because I'm not adding any other well, a little bit of moisture with the dates, but that's, yeah, so, so no on that. And uh, so I'll just, I'll just scoop that into my bowl here. Now, there's nothing that says if you like car carrots, you, you use about a medium zucchini. And there's nothing that says that you can't use a carrot either. So you could do a small zucchini and a small carrot. This is ground up pecans. So we'll put that in there. And so once those are in there, we'll just kind of stir it 
I'm just stirring it around to kind of get the, I'm gonna get the uh, zucchini all coated. So I think you can see it really must be too, is that I think you can get the sense that it really doesn't take a long time to do it. So I think you can kind of see it's been, all the zucchini has been pretty well coated. So the sweetener is dates um, and this is about three quarter cup of chopped dates. And I've put some hot water on them earlier just to soften them up a little bit. We'll put them in the, uh, the mini Cuisinart. And you could, you, could, you could grate up an apple. I happen to have a half a cup of unsweetened applesauce. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. And I'll, I'll mix that with the dates just to give it a little bit more volume and make it easier to pull out. And it doesn't take, it doesn't, it doesn't take much blending, sorry. So this is, this is nicely blended up now. I think, you know, you can kind of see how the dates and the applesauce. And so this will be easy to incorporate into the coated zucchini. Kind of made like a paste or a puree. It is, yeah, yeah. I know you let you, do, are you still doing your paste? Yeah, do I do. And I just, I, yeah, I keep it in the fridge at all, at all times. All right. I thought about that. Um, well, I just, I guess I just haven't gotten there. So this, this is easy to stir into the, into the zucchini mix. So we'll give this a few turns. These are great. You know who likes these are my grandkids. Well, that mess. So it's people. always nice when they're, when they're hanging they out mean, and they want a little snack. Must. Problem is, is that they, they go to school and they get scratched at school. And uh, well, I tell you what, once they get a few tastes of added sugar, it's a um, different story. Your, your sound, I don't know if you're moving away from the mic, but your sound is- Yeah, I, 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 I lifted back a little bit. So this, this is what it looks like, it's ready to go. And so now you can just scoop it up into, oh, sorry, one last thing. Um, the juice of about a quarter lemon, just add a little acidity to improve the leavening from the baking powder and baking soda. Makes a slightly lighter muffin. You know, I just got some. That's zucchini. it. Yeah, I'm gonna. A lot of people are saying they're gonna make these because these ingredients are things that many people just have on hand anyway. Absolutely. And I think um, I I I just did a calculation. This will make about a dozen, eleven or twelve muffins, depending on how how big a scooper you use. I just kind of use a standard scooper and usually get about a dozen. And the, the nutritional profile is pretty good. I think it's about 160 calories. And I, I, I figured out the fiber content, but I already forgot. I don't know if you still now that there or not, but you know, you're, you're, getting, you're getting whole grains. Um, and obviously, you know, the zucchini is, What's that high in vitamin A or something? Um, and so, you know, they're pretty they're pretty healthful muffins, and they're they're a great snack. If you want if you want to have them for breakfast, you probably need two or three of them. But um, certainly, they're a great snack to take on the road, and you know, if you get the afternoon hungers at work or something like that. So, yeah, we usually we usually have a bunch of them in the freezer. 
the last kind of up to a week in the refrigerator, um, if it's going to be longer than that, you probably ought to freeze them. Yeah, you have frozen them, I know. And it's pretty simple. I think you saw how, how, how quick it goes. Well, I, do you ever think about publishing a recipe book? Yeah, most of, I don't know if this is on, Kathy's got a, a, a website, veganmyheart.com. So she does share a lot of our recipes there. I don't know if this one's there or not, but uh, we should put it up there. So Let me look. Yeah, we I... talked about it, but. Oh, nice. I'm, I'll add that to the show recipes. notes. There's a lot of good, uh, there's a lot of good cookbooks out there already. I would recommend unprocessed. <laughs> I, I, I give you a shameless plug. Huh? Thank you. I do see some recipes on there. So uh, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll post the link, but the, the pictures look great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, you have so. your squash for dessert. You have your squash for dessert recipe on there that I've had. That's oh, also delicious. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, you can tell we're, we're into vegetables for dessert. Squash puree, black bean cupcakes. I think black bean cupcakes, by the way, also have beet and a whole orange in them. Including including the rind. That's great. Well, that's, I think you should sneak them in any way you can. Yeah, for sure. And they took the presenters like they should. Yeah, you got can't hear you sometimes. So I don't know if you're moving, but sometimes I can't hear you. Okay. I'll stand still. Yeah, our sound is cutting out. Um, can you guys hear Dr. Klonicky? Worried about that. Can you say something so I can see if I hear you? Yeah, oh, yeah. You're back. I, I you're back. Okay. You're back. Yeah, the squash for dessert recipe is a really good one. It's kind of like a pudding almost. It really is. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. She had a lot, she had a lot of fun doing those because uh, she always likes to take a picture with something in it, a little figurine or flowers or something like that. So. So, but to, you know, your original question, I don't know. I, 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 I am trying to write a book on my experience and I've got 18 chapters and started on the appendix. There may be some recipes in there, I don't know. But I don't know if anybody's gonna be interested in reading the book. Um, maybe my kids, I don't know. But I have to figure out if I actually have this book, I have to figure out how do I publish it? you know, all that sort of stuff. Who would be, there's so many books out there. There really are. And the other thing is, is that you can Google a lot of stuff already. You know, so if you're, if you're into cooking to, to begin with, and you have favorite recipes, it's very easy to go and, and modify them so that they're plant-based. I was just looking at a, um, uh, America's Test Kitchen did a vegan cookbook. I, I, have, have you seen that by any chance? I didn't realize they did a, they did a, did they do a vegan book? They did. And I, I just finished looking at it just sort of before the show. And there's a lot of recipes that sound good that I wouldn't mind doing. But um, the problem is, is that, um, you know, they still use a lot of uh, olive oil and coconut oil. And uh, so like when we cook, we try to pretty much, we always eliminate those and, you know, go with broth or water or, um, and I, I, I don't think that they fully realize the potentially negative impact of too much oil, you know, particularly on endothelial function. And so I feel like I should write them a letter, although very few people, you know, very few people respond to my letters, you know, so because I'm always complaining about, you know, like I complained to the Sacramento City School District on their school lunches, you know, because my grandson is, start, is going to first grade next year, but I never heard back from them. And I just recently wrote a letter to the CEO at Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, and I didn't hear from him. Uh, <laughs> so... I suspect if I write a letter to America's Test Kitchen, I won't hear from them either. 
Aww. Well, Lucy says, I hope your book can help other physicians learn about plant-based eating. And Mona would like to know, did your children go plant-based? Oh, great. Um, yes. So we have four sons. And um, I would say that two of them, one is 100% plant-based. And, and, and it's kind of interesting. He's always, he's always checking on added sugar. He won't, eat, he won't do anything that has added sugar in it. So one of the other sons calls him the Joe Stalin of sugar. Uh, so he's he's hundred percent. Son number two is about sixty percent. Uh, son number three is ninety five percent, and son number four about ninety percent. So um, and it's kind of interesting because um, what was really cool is none of them none of them did it. Um, you know, we, we didn't hassle anybody about it. We didn't say, oh, you ought to do this, blah blah blah. And they all uh, did it kind of just from watching us. Uh, and I think that, you know, it was fairly impressive, um, you know, that, that, I had, that I had weight loss and I was able to stop, you know, two of my three medications. Um, and I think they also recognize the fact that, you know, there's heredity, there is some heredity involved, you know, in that, um, my dad had a heart attack. Kathy's dad had bypass. You know, so there, there is heart disease in the family. So I think they took it seriously in terms of their lifestyle. Um, and it, we, we also belong to a um, gourmet group. And um, so it's kind of interesting that they, there's four couples and they, they all have significant ongoing health problems. And it's very frustrating to us that, you know, they, they see how we eat and what we serve them when they come to our house. But um, none of them were changing their lifestyles until about a year ago, one of the women did. And she was absolutely flabbergasted because she lost weight and she was able to stop her high blood pressure pills. So she was just absolutely ecstatic. Um, so, but, um, but it, it, and, and actually I have four physicians right now, uh, all retired from uh, Kaiser Permanente that uh, they're not really following me is not the right word to use, but you know, they're, constantly asking about this and that they've, they've gone plant-based uh, and actually one of them used to be my boss and it was kind of interesting his cardiologist was up to date and recommended the Esselstyn program to him and he actually went to Cleveland and met with Caldwell Esselstyn but now I'm kind of providing you know books and articles etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, to them so I mean there's a small sea chain but um, I don't know, it, it, you know, we were just down in Southern California last week. And the interesting thing was that, you know, we spent three days in Santa Monica. Santa Monica is rife with plant-based eateries. Uh, I, I mean, it's incredible. I, I, I wish the same thing would happen to Roseville or Sacramento, but you walk up and down Montana and there's just, one after the other. Uh, and that was, that's very exciting to see. And they're busy too, you know, so, and, and I think Kathy pointed out that we were at shopping, I think at the local, well, yeah, we were at the local Whole Foods and every plant-based item was either sold out or nearly sold out, you know? So th there's, there's a demand for this. Uh, and so I think consumers have a lot of power if they, if they want this, this way of, of eating, then, you know, it, it'll eventually happen. Until then, you're going to have to cook at home. <laughs> Absolutely. I just want to thank Grandma Gigi for her super chat donation. Thank you so much. And Andy Jacqueline wants to know, do you have a before picture? I have a before picture? Mm -hmm. how, how fat does she want to see me? <laughs> Santa Claus. I tell you, um, I, I do, but it's squirreled away someplace. Uh, at my maximum, I weighed 269 pounds. 
I now weigh 191. Wow. My weight on my weight on the high school football roster in 1967, 1966 was 195. So this is the size that I was in in high school. Mm -hmm. But you know that's a significant drop. What's the math on that? Seventy pounds, seventy something. If you pounds. have the picture, I can add it to what you know when we do the little thumbnail. If you like, I'll have to, I'll have to dig it out. You know, it's funny because I ran into it. I don't know, maybe a year ago, and I and I asked my wife, "Is it? Is this me? <laughs> I doesn't even look like me." You know, I mean, that's it's very strange. Well, congratulations on your success. If you knew then what you knew now, maybe do you think you might have raised your kids plant based? Um, you know, yeah, probably. Yeah. You know, because, because we don't have, we don't have foods in our house that aren't plant-based, you know, that's, um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of what processed foods we might eat. You know, there might, we might have five tortilla chips sometimes, but there are no other processed foods in our house. There's no dairy in our house. There's no cheese in our house. There's, um, I mean, they, they would have to, they would starve if they didn't, you know, let's put it that way. I'm trying to think, isn't there a, a Dr. Barnett out in Rochester? Do you know who I'm talking to? Yeah, he's been on the show, Dr. Ted Barnett, sure. Ted Barnett. I, you know, I was in communication with him and his kids are, to, you know, at, le at least, you know, they switched, he and his wife, and their youngest child is totally, was always raised plant-based, you know. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I, there's no question about it. When I think back about it, and we had one son who always battled obesity, um, not badly, but, and then another son had bad acne. And I, I think both of those would have been avoided on a plant-based diet, you know. Yeah. So absolutely, we would have, yeah, there would be no reason not to be plant-based for everybody if, you know, if that's what we did, you know, so I, I you know, I think kids, if, if they're hungry, they're going to eat what you serve them, you know, if they know that, if they know that you can be had and that you'll give them a cheeseburger or whatnot, then they'll, they'll pester you on that. But at some point they're going to get hungry in a I remember at one at one of the one of the talks, somebody said, and I can't remember who it was, but I thought it was kind of poignant. She said, "If your kid won't eat an apple, they're probably really not hungry." <laughs> so, absolutely. Right. Well, you can always give your kids two choices: take it or leave it. Right. Okay. Eat or don't eat. <laughs> okay. Um. Come back, your, 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 your volume just went away again. I wonder if that's the streaming, though. Okay. Still can't hear. The, I wonder if that's the streaming because I'm not moving. Yeah, yeah. well, I know you didn't want to use the, the, the browser that I told you that we normally use okay. for this show. Sure. And I, I wonder if that's a factor, but anyway. Um, I think you should write your book because, you know, if you can't get a publisher that in, is interested at this moment, you can always self-publish it because I'm sure there's plenty of people that you could help that would want to hear your story. Okay. I'll give it a try. I got to finish it though. Well, yeah, that, that I would, that I would recommend. Definitely. <laughs> so if people want to engage with you, do you have any social media presence or cause you're, you are retired now from Kaiser. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I'm happy you, if you want to share my email, I, if that's something you'd want to do, that's okay by me. I don't mind people. I don't mind people writing this quantity okay. at Hotmail. All right. I'll put, I'll put, well, I, I would always ask permission. To, I will do that. Well, thank you. And maybe you'll come up with some more great recipes or open a bakery up here in Roseville. If somebody, and if somebody looks at veganmyheart.com they can always engage kathy that way too you know right. I, I did i did add that already so i'm going to add your email as well if they want to contact you that's fantastic all right well this was a lot of fun and your muffins are the greatest i've had them and they're delicious and you can freeze them and they're easy to make thanks, thanks for having me on it well, made me made me make more muffins well you know, you know if, if that's what i say at the very least at least you got to cook your muffins for the week right right for sure.
Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Klonicky. It was so nice spending this hour with you. Thank you, AJ. Take, Take care. care. Thank you. And thanks Bye-bye. all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back a bit earlier tomorrow because my guest has to catch a plane. It's Chef Colin Goodine. He'll be coming on at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and he'll be making spinach mushroom tacos with a mango coconut ceviche, and he's going to be making the tortillas from scratch. And those recipes will be in the show notes. What are show notes, you may ask? Well, when you're watching on YouTube, you see this video. If you look right underneath the video, there's this word more. You click it. And those are the show notes. And that's where we're putting the recipe 